You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Gelt Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Gelt will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. We're happy to have back with us Terry O'Dean. Terry's a professor of finance at the Haas School of Business at the University of California in Berkeley. His research focuses on how psychologically motivated decisions invest uh, affect the way investors make decisions and how they affect prices. Uh, he's recently come out with a new paper, and uh, we've invited him back to talk to us. How are you doing today, Terry? I'm good. I'm happy to be here. So tell me, what's your new uh, study all about? Well, uh, so this is a, uh, a study done with, with two co-authors, uh, Brad Barber at UC Davis and Michelle Strahilovitz, who's at the Golden Gate University and uh, is Israeli, lived in Israel for, for many, many years. And uh, the title of the paper is Once Burned, Twice Shy. How naive learning, counterfactuals, and regret affect the repurchase of stocks previously sold. And what we're interested in here is the psychology of investing, mostly focusing on individual investors, what makes them uh, buy the stocks they buy, what makes them, we're also in, you know, in other studies trying to figure out what makes them sell the stocks they sell. And what I think is one of the uh, so insights of this paper and, and, and the work that my co-authors and I have been doing is that when investors buy stocks, usually this is a forward looking process. People are buying because of what they think is going to or they hope is going to happen in the future. But most selling is backward looking. Uh, people like to sell for a gain because it makes them feel good. They feel bad if they sell for a loss. So they hold on to their losers. Uh, the exception on the buy side is if, if someone has owned a stock uh, recently, like in the last year or two, then what happened when they owned it the first time, what has happened since they sold it, determines whether they buy it again. In short, people like to buy stocks they've owned before if they made money on it the first time, and if they can buy it at a lower price, uh, then they sold it. Right. That's interesting. I've spoken to people, and you know, clients come into my office uh during my day job when I'm a financial advisor. And uh, sometimes they'll say, you know, Doug, I watch this stock. It trades between about 40 and 50. And uh, what I plan to do, my strategy is, they, they tell me, I'm going to buy it when it's trading around 40 and I'll sell it when it hits about 50. And then I'll just wait because I see it does this over and over again. Is that what yeah, people expect to happen? Yeah. Yes. Well, first of all, you know, we know that people tend to expect uh, the recent past to repeat itself. And that's why in general, if you see people buying a stock they haven't owned before, uh, there's an overwhelming tendency to buy stocks with strong recent returns. People like to buy things that have been going up because they believe that they are going to continue to go up. And so this is this idea of buying something that's gone down is exceptional, but it, it tends to run the way you just described. It's it, people have been following the stock, uh, they had, they may have, you know, as I say, had experience with it, and they think, oh, it's going to go through this back, you know, down up cycle. We think that investors also tend to match their trading. Uh, it's sort of like they can't do what you'd really like to do, which is buy a stock before it goes up, sell it before it goes down. But you can choose to uh, hold on to stocks that go down and not sell, sell them, you know, wait until they've got up till, uh, till you sell them. And you can choose only to repurchase stocks that you are able to sell at a higher price and uh, buy back at a lower price. So it's as if people match the trading behavior that would make them a profit when, uh, when they can, but actually um, it's not profitable. For example, we, we take a look and see that the stocks that people sell for profit and repurchase at a lower price, after they repurchase them, these stocks underperform the market. So the behavior that we're documenting is not improving their performance. 
I see. So it, just to clarify, when someone buys a stock and makes money on it and, and sells it, actually realizes the gain, and then he keeps an eye on this company, and when he sees it drop again, he's inclined to buy back in, thinking he's net. When, when it drops below his previous sale price, then he buys back in? Yeah, that's the, that's the pattern that, that we document. What we think is driving this is, to a large extent, uh, that people are trying to avoid the feeling of regret. So if you sell a stock for a loss, chances are you don't really want to spend much time thinking about that. You feel bad that you sold for a loss. Uh, you, you regret that you bought it in the first place. Uh, when you sell for a loss, it's, you know, it's sort of a permanent uh, that that investment didn't work out. So you're not likely to think about it. You're not likely to buy it again. Buying it again just puts it back in your portfolio where it reminds you that you screwed up the last time. <laughs> so so you, you're much more likely to buy a stock that you sold for a profit. And you're not likely to buy it at a higher price because if you buy it at a higher price than you sold it, you're going to regret that you sold it. So if mm -hmm. I buy something at $80, sell it at $120, and then buy it back again at $140, I think to myself, well, why did I sell at $120? I wish I'd never done that. But if you can buy it, sell it at $120 and buy it back again at $80 or $100, then you get to feel particularly good. You know, it's uh, you can say, oh, I sold for profit and I was really smart. I got out at the right time. I got back in at the right time. So we think that largely investors are trying to enhance their emotional experience uh, to some extent at the cost of their uh, financial gain. I gotcha. We are talking to Professor Terence Odeen, who is at the University of California in Berkeley. He's a specialist and speaks very widely about how people make decisions about their investments based on all sorts of emotional reasons, very few of them perhaps rational. So based on what you're telling me now, do people ever make rational decisions on their investments? Oh, yes, I'm sure. You know, yes, people do ever make rational decisions. <laughs> They're, yeah. There are a lot of people who are uh, very rationally choosing to save for retirement and put their money in uh, well-diversified, low-cost mutual funds and hold it there for a long time, and that all looks pretty rational. Uh, but there are also investors who churn their own accounts, uh, run up their transactions costs, buy and sell uh largely because of their emotional response to what's going on rather than uh, sort of a, a clear considered plan. Uh, you know, so we, we have a world with both types of investors. Uh, you know, I, I, I focus a lot of my research on, you know, the, the ones who are trading more actively. It's, uh, it's hard for me to you know, establish that people are making decisions um, uh, sort of based on psychological issues when I don't see them uh, doing much. And it's also, you know, I, I would I, I hope that some of this research helps the investors who are not behaving, you know, not uh, optimally uh, mm -hmm. to learn to trade better and invest better. Well, one of the things you mentioned before, you said this study that you're involved in now has to do with regret that people uh, are trying to control whether they will regret the decision that they made previously. Uh, other research you've done focuses more on fear. Do one of these emotions have more of an influence than the other? Oh, I think of fear. I haven't actually explicitly studied fear. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm working on a... a project right now that's sort of experimental economics that where we are trying to sort of see what happens when when you induce a, uh, feelings of fear. We have people watch uh, five minutes from a horror movie and then they trade in an experimental market <laughs> and, and and we find actually that that they there's less uh, irrational exuberance under those circumstances. We don't get bubbles in those markets as much as if we show them an exciting, exciting video. But really, we get the, the lowest instance of bubbles seems to be when you show them a very boring video. 
hand, you get them in a, you, you, you get them in, a, them in a subdued mood. I think that fear enters in when everything's been running, running pretty smoothly, and then suddenly it looks like the world's changing, and people remember uh, that they can lose that they can lose money. You know, I mean, the big the 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 couple of years ago, uh, when the when the market started to dive and it wasn't clear how far how far it could go down, there was a lot of fear around. That. Friends of mine who are financial advisors said that they were spending their days trying to keep their clients from panicking and pulling everything out of the market. Mm-hmm. And you know, this was a big problem. Uh, one of my good friends said, "Well, she only lost. She only had two clients who over." overruled her and said, take everything out and, and, and put it all in, you know, the equivalent of money market funds. And as she said, that that meant that they would not be able to retire when they had thought they would. That, you mean that they locked they, in their losses at that time? They, exactly. They locked in their losses and she said, they cannot, they, they were down, uh, you know, 30 to 40 percent uh, because they had a mix of, of stocks and bonds. And she said, you know, They've just given up on the possibility of, of recovering that if the market comes back. And this is going to mean that they're going to have to work for another five, ten years. Uh, and those particular clients sold, I don't know, within two weeks of the bottom. And, wow. uh, you know, in general, I, I think I, I understand it's extremely difficult when the market is is tanking and you don't know how far it could go. Uh, to just sort of sit there and, and right. stay feel in like it. you should do something, right? Yeah, yeah. My experience in, in was, general. Right. Go ahead. I was going to say my experience was similar, also with clients around that time. We were also talking to people about still looking at the long term, and uh, I think I only had one client who said, "Doug, it's all well and good and that long term stuff, but I think the world is coming to an end. Sell." But it was only one guy. You know, everyone else understood that this was. Uh, I mean, they were unhappy because no one likes watching the market go down, but they understood what was going on. So I think what people need to do, and this is probably, you know, you help your clients do this, is think these scenar- scenarios through in advance and decide what you're going to do, uh, rather than make the decision when you're feeling fear and panic. And maybe, you know, yeah, I mean, you might have a rule that might involve uh, selling, you know, you at, at some point, but you don't want what you really don't want to be is being is is whipsawed, where the market dives and you sell everything, and then you know some other people stay out and then they get back in after the market recovers, and while it's very difficult to predict what the market's going to do, it's fairly easy to to say that if you have a strategy of selling after big drops and buying after big gains. Yes, the, <laughs> the buy high, sell low approach to investing. Yeah, it's not going to work out that well. Yeah, we discourage that also. Yeah, and that's, that's a very common emotional response, though, because yeah. people, if the market has gone down, they think it's going down. And if it's gone up, they think it's going up. In fact, the, the language is it, it, it describes the market that way. People say to me, you know, the market is going up. And my response usually is along the lines of what you mean is it has recently go, gone up. Neither you nor I know what it's about to do. Uh, but the, you know, the, and people say, you know, I've heard people say, they think real estate's going up, real estate's going down. And thus the, the language itself projects the recent past into the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. Listen, this, Terry, we're just about out of time, but uh, the research you're doing is fascinating. Tell me in the last minute, just how can people follow what you're doing, and especially some of the the new information that you are uncovering? Oh, you mean the, see what it's going on with our research? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I post things on my website, uh, just uh, odean o d e a n dot org o r g. So uh, new research gets posted on the website. Uh, if you want to look at research in finance in general, what's going on, there are two. You can, there's a website, ssrn.com. Uh, most researchers post their 
our recent working papers on that website. And then, of course, Scholar Google, you can find almost anything. But yeah, uh, I and most of the uh, academic researchers uh, try to keep our, our most recent stuff posted so that our colleagues and your listeners can, can read about it. Great. Okay, we have been talking to Professor Terence O'Dean from the University of California at Berkeley. You can check out the research that he's doing at O'Dean, O-D-E-A-N dot org. And uh, Terry, I want to thank you again for being on the show, and I hope we'll have you back on again soon. I look forward to it. Thanks a lot, Doug. Thanks. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.